Hello, I'm Pastor Joel Silberman. Thank you for watching Regeneration Television Broadcast. It's my hope that through this message you are encouraged and made stronger in Jesus Christ and the truth of His Word. Enjoy this message and may God richly bless you. All right, so we are going to continue uh, on our teaching of First Timothy and Pastor Joel laid a great foundation, speaking of foundation, for us last week. And uh, we read and heard and learned about Timothy and how he was really tutored and mentored and discipled under Paul. And uh, that took several years. And uh, how Paul really tended to this young man because God had a future for this young man. God had a purpose. He had a destiny. You know, it's interesting to always keep in mind that when God brings people together, he has an agenda. You know, we may say, oh, well, we're just here, we love one another, we're in the same church, it's a blessing, it's wonderful, but God has an agenda. So that person sitting next to you is very important to the Lord, and therefore needs to become very important to you, because God has a plan. And so, his plan is that we would walk in his destiny, and uh, see that the purpose he has really unfold, whether it's in an individual life, or in a corporate life. Now when we look at Timothy's life, we're gonna see that God had a destiny and a purpose for him, but that destiny was going to affect multitudes of people. So Paul was grooming him, probably maybe not even knowingly at first, because it took so many years, but this young man was being groomed to head a church uh, in a city called Ephesus, which is basically, we would say, in the country of Turkey today. And this church became one of the most profound churches of its day. So this young man that we uh, heard last week had a little bit of shyness in him, I'm sure his own apprehensions, his own fears. These were very normal people, like you and I are normal people. They had their own real issues. God was going to take him, anoint him, appoint him, and place and position him in an extremely, extremely significant part of the body of Christ at that time. So it's important to understand that when the times that we live in, we are here for a purpose. And uh, God has great significance attached to each and every person's life. Now the key with Timothy and Paul was as Paul loved, mentored, trained, tended to Timothy, Timothy honored, trusted, trusted, and was loyal to Paul. And so there was an interaction there within them of a father to a son spiritually and a spiritual son to a father. And out of that love and out of that commitment came a loyalty and a trustworthiness that the Holy Spirit could literally build upon. We have talked for so many months over this whole past year of the character of Christ that needs to be formed in each and every one of us. This wasn't just, oh, Timothy is gifted, so let's place him in this position. This was Timothy is gifted, but he has proven himself to be a mature man of God to Christ, to Paul, to the word of the living God. So these were key components that Paul was making sure were evidence, they were manifested. Uh, he was living proof of God having done a miraculous, wonderful change in his life. And this young man was going to bring that living proof uh, many, for many, many people that he would affect in those years to come. Paul actually trained, and we're gonna go into a lot of this today, uh, was stayed in Ephesus for a period probably of almost three years, and there was great teaching, training going on at that point, much discipling. But I thought it'd be interesting, because as I was doing this study, I said, Lord, I always love a little bit of history. What was going on, you know, in the times that they lived in and the people and so forth. And so let's look at our first PowerPoint. So Ephesus is the city in Turkey. It is a very profound city. It would be like us saying Manhattan. People knew of it. It was known throughout the Roman world. And so our first PowerPoint says, a, a Roman writer once called Ephesus Lumen Asia, which literally means the light of Asia. Ephesus, with a population of 300,000, was the chief commercial city of the province and the center, this is real interesting, of the mother goddess of worship, which was the goddess Diana, also known as Artemis. And that was of Western Asia. 
In the New Testament era, it was the fourth greatest city in the world after Rome, Alexandria, in Egypt, and Antioch of Syria. So this was a profound city. You know, sometimes I think when we read different things in the Bible, we think of people almost being, you know, living in small places or places that weren't so. These were huge cities. These were the Manhattans and the Washington DCs of their day. And so the people who lived there were basically pagan. They had not really known the conversion of, of Christ yet. And this was the gospel. Remember, Paul was released and his purpose was to bring to the Gentile nations the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right, so let's look at some of the obstacles. We talk about obstacles today for us, the obstacles they had to deal with. Let's look at our next PowerPoint. So this temple of Artemis, or Diana, as she was called by the Roman name, at Ephesus, ranked as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. This was no small little temple like high whatever. This would be a huge monument, like we would say the monuments that are in Washington, D.C., uh, she was known as the twin sister of Apollo and the daughter of Zeus. Artemis was known variously as the moon goddess, the goddess of hunting, and the patroness of young girls. I won't even go into that, but I believe there is a real revelation on movies being released and when you see what this spirit was really about. The temple of Artemis in Paul's day was supported by 127 columns, each of them 60 meters or 197 feet high. You know how high that is? So picture how big this place is. The Ephesians took great pride in this grand edifice. During the Roman period, they promoted the worship of Artemis by minting coins, literally melting down silver and making coins with the inscription, Diana of Ephesus. For over a thousand years, this goddess with her temple provided a focal point for the rich the religious, the economic, and cultural life of her worshipers. So you see how significant this worship of this pagan god was entrenched, entrenched in this society. Everyone knew of it. Uh, people traveled from miles and, and who knows how far and longed to get there to even see these things. This was a profound worship of a pagan god by Gentile nations. So here comes these little tribe of Jewish men coming in with an entirely different message that that god is a false god and we want to present to you the picture, the proof, and the truth of the living God. Just picture yourself going into this city with the message of Christ. Yeah, we, we would all say, wow, that's a little bit daunting, a little bit overwhelming. So if you think that was daunting and whelming, look at our next PowerPoint. Ephesus was full of, everybody say full of, wizards, sorcerers, witches, astrologers, diviners of the entrails of animals, this is what they worshiped, and people who could read one's fortune by the palm of the hand. And yet, after the preaching of Paul, the magicians publicly burned their books so the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Now you can read this whole story in Acts 18 and 19. It's literally amazing. I really encourage you to read that story and read 1 Timothy, all of the chapters in preparation for these Sundays where we're preaching on it. So Timothy and Erastus were with Paul, but he sent them on to Macedonia while he himself stayed in Asia for a time. I won't go into all of it, but in this city there was literally an uproar, a revolution. They turned this city upside down, and the reaction was they wanted to just kill them and tear them into pieces because it wasn't only going over the, after their religious mindset, it was going after the economy. Now how many of us know once you touch a person's checkbook you are in big trouble? And this was what was happening with them in this day. Let's look at our next one. The disturbance over Diana of the Ephesians is one of the most prominent stories in the book of Acts. Again, Acts 19, 23 through 41. There were 33 temples in the Greco-Roman world where Diana was worshipped. 
Think about that. 33 temples. After Paul's preaching in Ephesus had harmed the local silversmiths who made statues of Diana. This was how they made their living. Paul's companions, Gaius and Arsacus, were dragged into the theater. The disciples would not allow Paul to go into the assembly. They literally protected him. These other men obviously took some very, very serious heat. So we see the significance of this city, the importance, what was really going on in this city when this little group of people walked into Ephesus with this word of the Lord. Let's look at our next one. On his second journey, Paul came to Ephesus and taught the 12 disciples, this is when he first started this journey, who knew only the baptism of John. That was what someone had gone through, their region, their area. They had learned about the baptism of John, was the baptism of repentance, repent for your sin. But they didn't have the full awareness or teaching or understanding of Christ Jesus in his fullness and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So he went into the synagogue and he spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. He later taught in the school of Tyrannus for two years, and as a result, all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And again, that's all in Acts 19. So Paul was establishing this church in Ephesus, and then basically Timothy was going to be placed in it as its shepherd, or as we would say, its pastor. But we can just imagine the conditions that this young man is now going to take over this church. Put yourself inside of his shoes. I always like to do that. Boy, how would I feel? I, I would be shaking on the inside for sure. So as we look at chapter two, we're gonna look at an overview of the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit now starts to address the church. Remember, Paul is come in, Timothy has come in, or the disciples of Christ are there, and so Paul is given the unction by the Holy Spirit that there is a group now of people that are really coming into Christ. There are conversions that are happening, but now this church needs to have structure. How many of us know you can't just have a whole you know, conglomerate of people come together and everybody has a different way of doing things. We would all say amen. All right, so remember in these years, the body of Christ is being molded. It's being shaped. It's being formed by the spirit of God. And God is literally looking to take these Gentile populations now out of their Gentile paganistic mindset and bring them into a godly lifestyle. Now, how many of us would say, wow, I mean, you're talking a serious work. How hard has it been for any of us who we wouldn't say, well, I shouldn't say that, but if we were raised paganism, um, or if we were raised in, in a denomination, but maybe even still had some teaching on Christ, who he was. These people were unknowing of Christ totally, completely. This was foreign thinking to them completely. And so Paul was given this mission, Timothy given this mission by the Holy Spirit to now literally start to guide these people, train them, teach them, disciple them come up against their rebellion, deal with them in love, in correction. But you're talking a serious work of sanctification in a group, a literally a population's mindset. That is very, very deep work. That work of sanctification has to happen in every single one of us once we come to the Lord. Because basically we are not to be looking the same as we were before. We should not be acting the way we did before. Now we know we can all fall into those things at times, but basically there needs to be a serious change in our lifestyle that says that's once how I lived, but I don't live there anymore. This is how I live. And so this book is literally a book of instruction. It's like the Holy Spirit giving to Paul and Timothy, here's how I want things done in this church because I, the Lord, know what I'm dealing with with these people. I, the Lord, know the mindsets that have to be changed in these people. And I, the Lord, know how to do this. So God never leaves us on our own. 
thank God. He gives us instruction. He gives us correction. He gives us a guidebook. And the guidebook is the word of God. It's literally the Bible. So this is what was going on, that the truth of God's word needed to be taught to these people so that they could begin to live a godly lifestyle no longer operating in their old ways. All right, so next one. So 1 Timothy 2, we're going to start with, Paul literally says, First of all, then, I admonish and urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be offered on behalf of all men. So God is saying through the Holy Spirit, no one is excluded. For kings and all who are in positions of authority or high responsibility, that outwardly we may pass a quiet and undisturbed life and inwardly a peaceable one in all godliness and reverence and seriousness in every way. For such praying is good and right, and it's pleasing and acceptable to God our Savior, who wishes all men, everybody say all men, to be saved, that means men and women, mankind, and increasingly to perceive and recognize and discern and know precisely the correct and the divine truth. So the overall structure is now being given to the church. And God's heart is saying, I want you to be praying for those that are in leadership over you, those that are in government over you, whether you agree with their positions or not, so that basically the gospel, <clears throat> excuse me, can go forth in the power of the Holy Spirit. Because how many of us know that if you have a government that clamps down on the gospel, it's going to be real hard to get that word out. And there are many nations that live in that kind of a condition today. So the, the overall instruction to the church, the first instruction he gives is pray for those who are governing you. Pray for those in authority. To, over you. And I would encourage us, we need to do that today. Whether we agree politically or not, we need to be praying for God to get an inroad into people's hearts and minds that are governing our nation. Amen? Amen. Now that's a very remarkable admonition from Paul because at that time they were under Nero. Now Nero was a ruler who at one point tremendous persecution broke out against the Christians. And they were put to death by the hundreds. Hundreds. So Paul is literally saying, don't look at what's happening, pray. Pray. That's the first word for the church of Jesus Christ. Pray that the word of God can go forth and that the instruction of how God wants his church to operate different from the world needs to be brought forth to these people. All right, let's look at our next one. So in verses 5 through 7, we're going to see why he's instructing that. And he says that all men would come into the truth. That is the heart of God. Look at verse 5. For there is only one God, only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Now remember what he's coming up against. Pagan mindset that have worshipped a female deity for over a thousand years. That's what he's coming up against. He's saying, no, no, there's nobody else. There's one person, and he is not only the God, but he says the man, Christ Jesus, because already, even in that early time of the church, heresies were coming into the church. One of the heresies was that Jesus Christ was never man. So he nips that in the bud, and he says, no, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people, a fact that was attested to at the right and proper time. And he says, and of this matter, I was appointed a preacher, an apostle. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I do not falsify, falsify when I say this, a teacher of the Gentiles in the realm of faith and truth. He just described his full destiny in Christ. He literally said, I'm appointed a preacher, I'm an apostle, and I'm a teacher, and I'm all of those things specifically to the Gentiles. So he knew who he was, and he was saying this to these Gentile people so that they would begin to understand he was anointed and appointed by the Lord. So he could walk in full authority, and he took his full authority. And you will see that as we go through this book. Next one. So both Peter and Paul stated 
that God wants all men to be saved. This is a theme that overrides these books, that it's Christ is the only way and that he wants all men to know him. And we see even in 2 Peter 3, 9, the word says the Lord does not delay and is not tardy or slow about what he promises according to some people's conception of slowness. But he is long-suffering, all say long-suffering. The word says extraordinarily patient toward you. Not desiring that any should perish, but that all should turn to repentance. So what is the truth he's bringing forth? He's saying here, the God-man, Christ, came. He was perfect God, perfect man, walked on this earth sinless. Your only way into eternal life is through the God-man, Christ Jesus. He's saying God's heart is that none would perish. God doesn't want anybody left out. Because remember, he's coming up against heresies. They were already in heresies about angels. They were in heresies about who was born forth or first, Eve or Adam. They were saying Eve was, and we're going to look at why. But all of these heresies, these lies, these untruths were coming into baby, baby Christians who didn't know. And I want to say something to this church. You need to know the word of God. Because you need to know the whole word of God so you can grow up in Christ. You remain a babe when you don't really know what's in the word. And that's people that get very taken out when things happen. And it's like, oh my gosh, well, this person said this. Well, I'm not sure about that. You know, this person says this. And then, then this person said this. And he's on TV for the last 19 years. Who cares? What's in the word? Do you know the full counsel of the word of God? Doesn't mean you have to know every scripture by name, but you should know the full counsel of the word of God. And this was the challenge and the charge that Tim, Paul was giving Timothy in this day with these people. All right, let's look at our next one. So therefore, in God's eyes, Christ Jesus is the only acceptable sacrifice to our sinful ways. We can all say amen. That is true today. Only Christ is the mediator who can stand between us and God, the Father, and bring us together again. We have reconciliation through Christ alone. Jesus, who is God and sinless man, he alone stands literally in the gap on our behalf. It's so good to know that. Do you know at this moment Christ is interceding for you? That you stand through your life, that you stand for Christ, that you don't crumble, you don't get destroyed, you don't come under. He's standing as an advocate before the throne of the Father and even though the enemy is whispering in his ear, you know what she did? You know what he did? You know what they're like? He says, it's all covered. It's all covered. It's all covered through me. That's why he is the only mediator. No Mary, no angels, no saints. He is the only mediator that can stand before the Father because he has purchase that place before the Father as the sinless man who came to the earth, lived in your shoes, lived in my shoes, and said, I've got him covered, I've got her covered, they're under me, and the Father looks at us and says, I see the blood, I see my son, you're out from under and come on in to your rich reward. That is eternal life. There is no eternal life separate from that. Let the church of Christ know the truth of the word of God. Come out from lies you have been taught and enter into the truth of the word of God. One man, one God stands before the Father and intercedes on your behalf. Bar none. Bar none. Bar none. Amen. Amen. Let's look at our next PowerPoint. So, Romans 5.18 verifies this fact about Christ. Paul writes to the Romans, he says, Well then, as one man's trespass, he's speaking of Adam, one man's false step and falling away led to condemnation for all men, so one man's act 
Christ Jesus of righteousness leads to acquittal and right standing with God and life for all men. Right standing. You stand before the Lord Jesus Christ with right standing. Doesn't matter if you're having a good day. Doesn't matter how well you did all week. Doesn't even matter if you read your word. If you know Christ and you've invited him into your heart, you have right standing. The word will grow you and empower you, but you still have right standing. For just as by one man's disobedience, Adam, failing to hear and heedlessness and carelessness, many were constituted sinners. That's all of us. So by one man's obedience, the blessed obedience of Jesus Christ, the many will be constituted righteous and made acceptable to God and brought into right standing with him. Oh, Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you for what he has purchased for each and every one of us. We will never know the depth of what Christ has purchased for us till we literally see in heaven. And then we will see. Oh, we will see. Our eyes will be open. All right, next PowerPoint. So in 1 Timothy 2, 6, we see that Jesus gave himself as a ransom for all. He is the price that's been paid. A ransom was the price paid to release a slave from captivity. We were enslaved to our sin. Enslaved to it in bondage and chains. Jesus gave himself as a ransom for all people, a fact that was attested to at the right and the proper time. And Paul again says, and of this matter about Christ, no small matter, I was appointed a preacher, an apostle. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I do not falsify when I say this as a teacher to the Gentiles in the realm of faith and of truth. Now, that is to the overall body that he is speaking. So just as we know he has spoken to the overall body, he's now going to address the men as a group and he's going to address the women as a group. Next PowerPoint. So verse eight, he says to the men, I desire therefore that in every place men should pray. Oh, not the women should pray. The men should pray without anger or quarreling or resentment or doubt or doubt. Catch the words he's using here. Pray without anger, <clears throat> quarreling, resentment, or doubt. No doubt in their minds. And they should be lifting up holy hands. That means to be a demonstration. When we lift our hands before the Lord, it's a, it's, we're signifying. I am honoring the God, the creator who made me. Lift up holy hands before the Lord. Besides being displeasing to God, anger, resentment, and bitterness make prayer impossible. When, let's just cut this down to real life. When a husband and wife have an argument on the way to church, how quick are they to run in and start praying for each other? Not usually. <clears throat> Not usually. Because <clears throat> these things breach unity. And once unity is breached, I don't really want to pray for that other person. And you see the whole carnality, our fleshly instincts, kick right up. And then we rationalize why we don't pray, why we don't lift holy hands, why we don't do whatever. It causes disunity. That's why the enemy loves to use it. Loves to use it. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 5, 23, so if when you're offering your gift at the altar, men, you there remember that your brother has any grievance against you, Leave your gift at the altar and go. First make peace with your brother, then come back and present your gift. We could do a whole week seminar on that one, male, male or female. But the reality is it breaches the unity. And the longer we do it, the deeper the trench goes. Think of all the trenches that have been dug in the body of Christ because we don't follow this one scripture.
one scripture. So God wants us all, but he is really speaking to the men on this, to obey him immediately and thoroughly. Our, go our goal should be to have a right relationship with the Lord and with other people. There's no having a right relationship with God and my relationships within the body stink. That is, you're living in delusion. Delusion. If you are right with the Lord, your, your relationships within the body should be right also. Male and female. And you should be looking to be one to make reconciliation, to ask for forgiveness, to extend forgiveness, to bridge any gap that has taken place. All right? So that is what he's saying very briefly to the men, but very succinctly. So I say to all the men, take it and chew on it. All right, now we're going to go into the women. Now I know everybody's like buckling their seatbelt because the <laughs> this passage in Scripture is usually a very confusing passage. But you're going to hear the truth today. All right, so 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 15. Let's look at our PowerPoint. Paul also says, I also, I desire that woman, women should adorn themselves modestly and appropriately, very important ladies, very important, and sensibly in deemly apparel. In other words, don't look like you're going to a club when you come to church. Not with elaborate hair arrangement of, of gold or pearls or expensive clothing, he says, but in doing good deeds. Deeds in themselves good and for the good and advantage of those contacted by them. All befits women who profess reverential fear for and devotion to God. He's literally saying, don't worry so much about the outside. Get the inside right. Let the love of Christ flow from you to others. Now, of course, we have this big verse. Let a woman learn in quietness, in entire submissiveness, all the men are going, yay, yay, yay. I allow no woman to teach or to have authority over men. She is to remain in quietness and keep silent in religious assemblies. Now, we're just going to finish the rest of the verse in the next PowerPoint. He says, for Adam was first formed, then Eve. So here is a heresy that's already gone out. That Eve, remember, they are living in a pagan female worship society. So it was a matriarchal society. Women were preeminent over men in this society. That's how they lived. That's what they believed. So he's saying, no, no, no. Adam was brought forth first and then obviously Eve. Nevertheless, the sentence on verse 15, the sentence to put upon women of pain and motherhood does not hinder their soul's salvation. Oh, sorry. It was not Adam, going back to 14, who was deceived, but the woman who was deceived and deluded and fell into transgression. So he's setting the order of the word of God straight. Then he says, nevertheless, the sentence put upon women of pain and motherhood does not hinder their soul's salvation, and they will be saved eternally if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control, saved indeed through the childbearing, notice it's a capital C, or by the birth of the divine child. So when you see scriptures like this, that you say, wow, I'm scratching my head on this, you have to interpret this scripture through the whole counsel of the word of God. What's the fullness of God's word say then regarding women? That she should be sitting in an assembly and never open her mouth? Is that the heart of God? To understand these verses, we must understand the times, and everyone say the culture, that Paul and Timothy lived and worked in. This is vitally important. First, in the city of Ephesus, as we've already discussed, this huge temple and the statue of the goddess Diana. The people of the city of Ephesus, Ephesus worshipped this false goddess. All men and women worshipped her. This was deeply embedded paganism for hundreds, we even read, a thousand years. So that is the worship to a false god. In that, however, the women predominated any gathering to worship. Not men. 
women dominated. It was totally matriarchal, matriarchal society. So secondly, you have this group of Jewish men who were taught and trained to be leaders in their households by the word of God. So you had this conflict. You had these men who were trained and, and years laboring with the Lord, Paul, Timothy, those with them. You had new converts coming in. Many, many, many were female. Many were male. But when these new women converts came in, their tendency was to keep on doing what they knew to do, which was, I'm a leader. I was a leader in the temple worship of, of Diana, so why aren't I a leader here? I know how to lead people. I know what to do. Does that sound familiar to anybody today? When you have new people coming in, so many times they'll say, I, I know what to do. Don't, I don't want you telling me what to do. I know what I have to do. And this is the same conflict that these men were having with these women. So the vital point here is this is a cultural situation for that time that they were living in and the situations that were arising in this brand new church. Is everybody getting it? Paul never intended that no woman should ever teach, preach, or open her mouth in a church. Never, that is never the heart of God. You know why it's really not the heart of God? Because probably 60 to 70% of the church is female. So do you really think God is not going to use the females? But many people have taken this, especially when they come from a very patriarchal kind of thinking. So you have to understand all these traditions have affected every one of us. Every single one of us, the way, your the way your ancestors have thought have affected you. And in essence, we start to believe that same thing is truth, never questioning it. That's why it is vital to understand the word of God. So here you had this conflict that was arising. New women who knew nothing about Christ were just babies, just being uh, tutored, trained, and learned. And here you had these Jewish men who were saying, we love you, we bless you, but quite honestly, if we want to get the teaching and instruction of the word of God across to this whole assembly, ladies, we need you to be quiet. Now, how many of us know women can be a little on the verbal side? Amen. <laughs> I, knew I, I knew I was getting an amen. So the women were told, zip it, sister. We got more things that we have to get across to the whole group. Amen. And the men said, all right. All right, now let's look at our next PowerPoint. Brian Simmons sums this up great. All right, so in Letters from Heaven, here's what Brian says. In the church, however, it was the men. Remember, the women were the female that were coming in from the paganism. He says in the church, however, it was the men, the Jewish men, who were commonly made up the leadership of the congregation. Paul telling the women to learn in silence means he was instructing them to take a respectful, respectful posture of a disciple in this new way of worshiping the true and living God. So he was basically saying when you come into a new, you're a new person coming into this gathering, Sit down, be quiet. Don't have something you have to tell somebody. Sit down, be quiet, and learn. Let the Holy Spirit instruct and guide. In this new way of worshiping the true and living God, when Paul instructs them not to be teachers, he was apparently referring to their old religious system. They taught pagan worship where it was the women who were the temple leaders and the teachers of their goddess religion in Ephesus. Doesn't that give a clear picture as to what that teaching really means? Do you know how many men and women in the years of counseling come in with the most twisted version of submission and male in authority and women in authority? Twisted twisted. And you know how you really see it's twisted? Because the man we've had, he'll come in with the Bible tucked under his arm 
and he's going to want to bring the truth to her. And I want you, Carol, to bring the truth to this woman. I'll be gl I'm very glad to bring the truth. Let me bring the truth of the full counsel of the word of God. So you can imagine where that went south real quick. But the problem is there's an agenda. When men or women have an agenda to prove themselves right over what the word of God says, God's going to cut the legs out right from underneath you. He'll bring you truth. See, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. He can't not bring us truth. He has to bring us truth. It's who he is. It's his very nature. But the truth sets people free. God doesn't want women in bondage. Amen. Dear Jesus, oh, my heart grieves, grieves. And where do you see some of the truths we still have? So Paul is telling Timothy that these women who are used to being outspoken leaders, that's what they were used to, they must be trained. They must be discipled. They need to be sanctified with humility and submission to the authority of church leadership. That was an unknown quantity to these women. There was no church leadership. They were the leaders. They must first come under accountability. They need to become submissive in a godly way where they can grow and learn before, before, before being placed in a leadership position. That's true of anyone. It's true of anyone. Because you're going to see as we read on in this book and we'll eventually get into Second Timothy, you're literally, uh, Paul literally tells them, do not put anyone new in leadership position. You are making a huge mistake. Why? They may have the gift, but they do not have the maturity to carry it out. Next one, <clears throat> next PowerPoint. Also in verse 15, where it says, nevertheless, the sentence put upon women of pain and motherhood does not hinder their soul's salvation, and they will be saved eternally if they come in faith and love and holiness with self-control, saved indeed through the childbearing, again, that's capital C, or by the birth of the divine child. Women are not saved through having a baby. Now, people look at this, if you're right, hallelujah. People look at this and say, what does this really mean? It means that the birth of Christ in us as a female or a male must take place. Out of the birthing of Christ in our lives, we reproduce that life and bring it to other. So in essence, you bear a child, you bear a spiritual child. If you don't even have to be a natural parent, there's spiritual childbearing that takes place. So there's a clarification there. Women are to reproduce the spiritual life of Christ Jesus in others, just as men are in Christ we are equal. Paul says there is no Jew, there is no Gentile, no, no Greek, no Roman. He's saying there's no male, no female. What is he saying? There's equality in Christ. The Lord God doesn't look at one here and one here. He uses all to his glory and for his honor. So here's the point I want to make, and we're wrapping up. When you read areas of scripture that are like this that seem hard to understand and it doesn't make sense to you. First, ask the Holy Spirit, what does this mean? Literally ask him, what does this mean? I don't get it. You don't have to get everything in the Bible. Ask him. Secondly, look up other scriptures and ask the Holy Spirit, show me other scriptures in the Bible that pertain to this topic so I can really begin to understand it. In other words, start to use the whole counsel of the word of God for interpretation. That's where you don't get stuck in silly arguments and disagreements with people, but you say, this is what the word of God says, and this is what I am holding on to. So when you hear someone say, which I have heard countless times in my years in the Lord, oh, Paul was against women. You're going to be able to say, no, that's not really true. That's not really true. 
And you can ask that person, did you read all the scriptures where Paul promotes women in leadership position in the Bible? I, I can guarantee you invariably they will say no. All right, but we're going to look at some. So let's look at the next PowerPoint. By the time Paul began his missionary movement, women were important agents within the different cities, all the different cities. The letters of Paul dated to the middle of the first century and his casual greetings to acquaintances offer solid information about many Jewish and Gentile women. So these Gentile women, they learned, who were prominent in the movement. Paul's letters provide vivid clues about the kind of activities in which these women engaged. Listen, we're going to go through these quickly, but I want us to really get this. Look at the next PowerPoint. All right, he greets. This is Paul. Greets Prisca, Juna, Julia, and Nera's sister who worked and traveled as missionaries in pairs with their husbands or brothers. Romans 16, 3, 7, 15. Paul also sends elaborate gr greetings to Trifnia, Trifosa, who labor for the Lord's work, and to Rufus' mother, Romans 16, 12 through 15. Priscilla or Prisca is es es expressly mentioned six times in the Bible as the wife of Aquila and as a missionary partner with the apostle Paul. They were also partners in the craft of tent making. And when Paul refers to Priscilla and Aquila, Priscilla is usually listed first, suggesting to some scholars that she was seen as the head of the family unit. That rocks some boats. All right, next one. Paul praises Junia as a prominent apostle who had been imprisoned for her labor, Romans 16:7. Junia is the only female apostle named in the New Testament. Junia and Andronicus are the only apostles associated with Rome that were greeted by Paul in his letter to the Romans in Romans 16:7. Paul greets this couple as kins persons and fellow prisoners and says that they are outstanding amongst the apostles. The fact that Adronicus and Junia are named as apostles suggests that they were evangelists and church planters like Paul. Next, Phoebe or Phoebe or Phoebe, Paul attaches to her three titles: diakonos, meaning deacon, literally a servant, sister, and prostatis, meaning a woman in a supportive role, a patron, or a benefactor. There is no difference, get this, when the title of deacon is used for Phoebe or Timothy. Hello. First Timothy discusses the criteria for deacons in the early church, which is explicitly directed to both male and female. Phoebe was especially influential in the early church seen in Jerusalem from the fourth century inscription, here lies the slave and bride of Christ, Sophia, deacon, the second Phoebe, who fell asleep in Christ. This Sophia is named after the first woman, Phoebe, because of this woman's devotion and dedication to Christ. Next one. Women flourished in the diaconate between the second and sixth centuries. Mary and Persis are commended for their hard work in Romans 16, 6, and 12. Chloe, a prominent woman of Corinth, appears to be the head of a household of an extended family. She and her household told Paul of the divisions in the congregation of Corinth in 1 Corinthians 1.11. Judea and Sancti are called Paul's fellow workers in the gospel in Philippians 4, 2, and 3. These are all women that Paul promoted into leadership because they had become trained, discipled, submissive, under authority, in godly ways. No man, no woman, can ever tell another person, you can't do something in Christ Jesus. No one has that right to do that. There is authority, we are all about governance and authority, but every person has a destiny to be fulfilled, male or female. And it's vitally important that we all be plugged into the Lord under the whole counsel of the Word of God so that we can allow the Holy Spirit to dispel in every one of us lies that we have believed 
that hold us down. See, lies believed keep you from walking in your full destiny in Christ. And they can be so deeply rooted, even for centuries. Look, you can have your own ancestors, your own mother, father, your grandparents. They'll say, oh, you'll never do that. Oh, you'll never measure up to anything. Those are lies. And God's spirit brings truth to the heart of each of his sons and daughters because he knows that truth will burrow in where that lie was and it'll uproot and tear down the lie. And the truth will lodge into the heart so that that person can be used and fulfill their destiny in Christ Jesus. You have a destiny, a good destiny. God-filled destiny. Jesus is rooting for you that your destiny be fulfilled. Fulfilled. Filled fully. Lacking nothing. Male or female. Let's stand to our feet. We hope you've enjoyed today's message. If you would like to hear more, we encourage you to visit our website. Also, if you're ever in the area, stop by. We would love to have you at Regeneration Church at Sunday service. Again, thank you for watching, and may God richly bless you.